welcome to Stop Button Favorites, a podcast of the website thestopbutton.com. My name is Andrew Wycliffe, and my website is thestopbutton.com. And Stop Button Favorites is a monthly podcast commentary track. This month it's going to be about the people that time forgot from 1977, directed by Kevin Connor, starring Doug McClure, Patrick Wayne, and Sarah. Douglas. Um, I'm watching the uh, copy of it from the iTunes store. I'm assuming it's the same print or close enough to it as is out on DVD from MGM. But if you get any of the online rentals, or online purchases, and iTunes has it in HD, and it'll definitely be this from the same transfer. And we're going to get started in 3, 2, 1, go. And Leo just roared. And now we've got the American International logo. So, when I was a kid, I loved King Kong and the stop motion dinosaurs. And so I saw a lot of dinosaur sci-fi movies and I eventually saw Land the Time Forgot it was on TV and I missed taping it or something and then saw it on Thorley Walters I think he played um, Watson in a Sherlock Holmes but um, the video store ended up having Land the Time Forgot and so I finally saw it got the Alan Hume directing director of photography on a American International. What I love about this movie is how classy it is. And I was going to get to that. I was trying to hurry up and get to how I came across this. I read Land of the Time Forgot the Burrows, or I tried to read it when I was eight, nine, ten, whatever. And then eventually the uh, there was a VHS release, an EP release of People the Time Forgot. So I finally got to see it uh, from Suncoast. There's your miniature ship. So what I was I was trying to say is I love the the classiness of the movie, um, and the Alan Hume photography really does that. And so, of course, she had Princess Leia hair. Um, the same year as Princess Leia had the hair. And so, when I first saw this, I had never seen a John Wayne movie. So my only experience with John Wayne was his kid, Patrick Wayne. It was interesting to later see the searchers and recognize Patrick Wayne. But all of a sudden you went for, it's this, it's a very confined set, right? They don't, I don't think they have an exterior deck set, but just the, there's just, mm, how to say this without making it sound, I wouldn't say trite, but the British are very good at period pieces. They 
sell it better. And it's sort of built into consuming media that as long as it's authentically British enough, you'll fall for it. I think that guy was in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the uh, younger officer. And of course, uh, growing up on King Kong, I grew up on King Kong versus Godzilla, which has the Arctic uh, setting at the, the beginning of the film. But never getting to see this in the theater, I was admiring, you know, the, the quality of the miniature work and just wishing I could see it on a big screen. And of course, there's the John Scott music. And I've been saying, of course, quite a bit. I, I just got the new text expander that tells you when you should consider making something, a text snippet into a uh, shortcut. And so you see the, the phrases you use the most. And so... But I mean, this shot, the um, composite shot there, it's not, there's a tenacity to it. There's, this is ambitious in a way that, it's ambitious, low budget adventure filmmaking. Um Hoping that kids will go for it, they'll be so enthralled with the story that they won't mind the miniatures and things like that. And that's that's a very big shift um, that Star Wars brought about that in order to sell it to the 13-year-olds, it has to look um, realer than real, which is sort of what um, Peter Jackson said about why he had to remake King Kong was because kids wouldn't watch the old one. And I've always thought that was an idiotic quote, but or an idiotic sentiment, actually, not a quote. But it, it's... It's, it's not a problem with special effects. It's a problem with uh, the way the audience has changed um, to not be willing to invest any imagination of their own into a film or a television show for that matter. Kevin Connors getting a lot of mileage out of that um, that one set there. Of course, he was shooting through the wall. <laughs> but we're only seven minutes in, and there's no... The first act is... Or, I mean, the setting up of the, the ground situation is mostly in quick expository dialogue. It's right into the action. Fantastic miniature work. So perfectly British. What's... Oh, and here we go. Now we get some... A decent close-up, but not that underbelly shot. But even that, you can tell, they're, they're working the not, well, some of the time. And that composite's not very good. But on the close-ups of the face, they actually were trying.
some of the editing is a lot these these Rodan like shots of the the pterodactyl circling them are, are nowhere near as effective as the quick cuts. I'm trying to remember if there was ever a time that I didn't like something because I thought the special effects were dated. Like when I was nine or something or eight and being a stupid kid. You know, the reality that the special effects have to create is in the context of the film, not in the context of reality. That's why your early 1930s movies can get away with turning exposition into a, a sort of a visual essay um, in some of those early mysteries and I'm thinking of a Michael Curtiz where he, he takes the roof off of a house to show where the bullet came from or something. And it was totally acceptable. It, you'd think the pterodactyl would be a little smarter than that, but very anticlimactic. I was also trying to talk over the fact that there were some, uh, way too long composite shots. Like this one. I it, That was such a boring shot and Connor kept going back to it. Kind of looks like the Batman TV show. But then you have these great shots and it's just, well, I mean, not this one, but the, the Sarah Douglas one with Thorley Walters. And you could have gotten away with that Patrick Wayne one in a little bit different. But I think it's the – looks like the lighting might just be a little bit off there. Because this is a composite, but the lighting's far better there. And so when I finally saw this, I just – this is nothing like Land That Time Forgot. Same director. I don't think the same screenwriter. But totally different um, – way of how the special effects work. And of course, it's not photorealistic, but It's just got to be cut well enough that you don't get distracted by it. Of course, the first movie, for the most part, shot on um, sound stages. This one, on the other hand, I don't know if this is the Azores. I, I, I found out where it was once and... Really wanted to read about it, but it's like nobody cared about the making of people that time forgot. When I decided to watch this for um, Stop Buttons Favorites, I was sort of going through a list of uh, my my posts, and I just remembered how impressed I was with it when I last saw it.
And it really does not have um, much of the enthusiasm that exists for Land the Time Forgot, which isn't a lot of enthusiasm, but there is some. People of the Time Forgot has almost none, which I don't understand because Sarah Douglas is fantastic in it, and she's hilarious on Twitter, and, you know, she was in Superman 2. That's the one that people like, so you'd think there'd be some popularity there. And the movie's been available on DVD for 10 or 12 years. It's just not... It's not campy enough. It's a little too... Um, Pseudo-highbrow as compared to the rest of the American International Edgar Rice Burroughs or Edgar Rice Burroughs like Doug McClure starring adaptations. I think they get a pet dinosaur who helps them. And I like that Patrick Stewart, or I'm sorry, Patrick Wayne is the straight man. Having four characters means there's a lot more room for interesting dynamics. Patrick Wayne was in some of the uh, not he was in some of the Sinbad movies and one of the things growing up in the 80s was you, you saw the Sinbad movies maybe not that intentionally but you did see them So, I'd seen him in something as a kid. I'm I'm sure of that. I just never motivated myself to go back and see the Sinbad movies again. One of the big differences between this movie and Land of Time Forgot is the way the dinosaurs work. This one's so much more cinematic with that breeze. the location shooting and the way the special effects are more integrated. But then, of course, we have this looks like a paper mache thing. And then you cut to this enormous tail that you only have to move once to get it somewhat believable. The scale of the miniature is really good, um, even though the composite there has some problems. Of course, this is entirely unrealistic size-wise. Of course, uh, 12 years later, the kids and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids would 
adopt an aunt to help them out. And it's one of those things where it's probably from an episode of Land of the Lost too, right? So it's a familiar trope in uh, giant animal stories. And so, if you've seen the first one, you know that Doug McClure is going to be in this one. Special appearance by Doug McClure. Um, So the credits and just the story, you know, they promise an answer um, to that character's story. Which is ostensibly why you're back seeing this movie. You're seeing it because you want to know if the people from the first one ever get rescued. So all of this stuff is delaying from the eventual... Connor's such a weird director for this. I mean, I think it, it, it works well, actually. But so but it's still delaying us from finding out what happens to Doug McClure. Sorry, I got distracted. Not stop motion. Not a stop motion dinosaur. I think it's on wheels. In the first one, it's a tropical paradise. I don't know if they ever get to a tropical paradise setting in this one. Uh, If you read the books, the... I think Burroughs wrote them as a whole and then published them separately. So he had like a map all set um, for publication to hint at what was coming in the, in the subsequent, in the two sequels. The John Scott score is actually out on CD somehow. I have a copy. It's really good. Yeah, Alan Hume. Didn't he shoot? I think he shot Return of the Jedi or something. Like, he, he's a he's a real cinematographer. And Connor's, uh, okay, so we're shooting the cast through the um, distortion of the flames there. There's occasionally shaky camera movement. He's really trying to make it seem real while he's being very controlled with um, his composition He's keeping it in uh, close-ups for some of this stuff, and it just it works. And that shot, of course, looks like it's a model, but then it's not. So, and so now we've got the three explorers, right, of the the lost world, and it, it, it reminds of Planet of the Apes. It reminds of You know, the 76 King Kong, but not really. It's more like Planet of the Apes. Um, 
and the location just makes it work. I mean, just. In the, um, is that a matte painting? Yeah, it is. Wow, that's a big matte painting. Um, but they match the lighting really well. I wonder how old Patrick Wayne was in this. He seems very young. Get a little... Seventies gender politics banter playing like it's the nineteen twenties. Oh, that's right, there's a cave girl. So back when I got a lot more readers on the stop button, I'd get readers who were Googling her. I can't remember what her name is. Dana Kimmel, I think. But I just get tons of readers from... Or hits. Probably not readers. Probably got hits. But... Gillespie. Dana Gillespie. So we basically have the same face as the Stegosaurus, only, or the same shape of the head, only it's got a horn on it. Those are not dinosaurs that correspond to any real dinosaur. They're really big, too. I think they're probably supposed to be Allosauruses. Everybody who couldn't do a T-Rex did an Allosaurus and just said it was an Allosaurus. But there's a time when Connor's direction just doesn't work, especially now with Hume's photography. Like, that's a goofy shot out of that terrible one they did um, to the Earth, at the Earth's core. which I believe they did the year before this one. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there, there was no scale to that sequence. But then we get back here, and we're back on location, and... We've got a British gentleman and a cave girl. It's funny. So this is the other way you make sure you get 13-year-old boys to go see the movie. There we go. Doug McClure. And so the other thing is with the pace of the movie... There's a lot of opportunity for um, the supporting uh, players and scenes to uh, get in little acting moments while they're not the focus of the, of the scene or shot. So, if you look at the um, trees and just the general type of mountains they're in right now, it doesn't look warm. Look, it's Doug McClure.
For a cave girl, she has really well clipped fingernails. Thanks to dinosaurs, there'd be some explanation of dinosaurs, the Jim Henson show, there'd be some explanation that she has those because there's a little dinosaur that eats fingernails perfectly or something. So you have a quick cut on a bad shot of Sarah Douglas comforting the cave girl, but then you get over to here and... This character is about as campy as it gets intentionally. Well, the mechanic was. But, I mean, you've got good nighttime photography. Selling the location again. The cave girl didn't want coffee, which is... Strange, since she would have no idea what it was. The book explains the reason, and it's more in the first movie, there are as you move around the, the land that time forgot, there are different um, stages of evolution. And the reason and it's accelerated and geographic and it's because of uh, weird molecules in the water. Um, the book goes really deep into it as time goes on uh, in this series. John Scott, of course, also did the score for King Kong Lives. Can't afford John Barry, you get John Scott. I think he also did the score for Grace Stoke, John Scott. He's really good. He, um, he brings a sense of scale to it, but he's not in the Jerry Goldsmith, um, John Williams school. And that is a terrible either kite or pterodactyl kite on a crane. And here's your punchline. Kind of really sets that up too. Again, it's for 10 to 13 year old boys. little bit more tropical so we've got to be in a different location sound designs ambitious which is cool even when it doesn't come off you gotta wonder what Were they playing any sounds for him? See, <clears throat> I always find sort of fantasy movie acting from this era it, 
there's a certain richness to the performances just built in. As long as you can sell it a little bit, you sell it the entire way. And it's an enth- it's a uh, enthusiasm for it um, and an ability to well, I mean the materials that is not Patrick Wayne. Was it? Because that was Sarah Douglas, but that did not look like Patrick Wayne in that shot. Well, I think some of it is the Sarah Douglas character is basically just Lois Lane. Which is kind of really cool because it's Lois Lane from the movie, um, from the 78 movie. I And there you go, better lines than in the Jurassic World preview. This genre sort of fizzled after the never-ending story, the exploration of the fantasy lands thing. The actors walking across locations and medium shots, and so on. There was a lot of it back then. It's British made from an American perspective. It's kind of funny. And in some ways, Patrick Wayne isn't even the point of reference. Uh, it's, It's the audience. Why does he keep shooting the flares? They're not scared of the flares yet. Okay, now they are. This is as opposed to the movies where people are worried about running out of their flares. He's got at least six. And we're back in, we're out of the tropics now. We're back in um, the piney looking trees. City of the Skulls, that doesn't sound scary at all. Yeah, the end of this movie reminds me of Temple of Doom. It it should be the other way around, obviously, but... I think it was, um... Mark Forrester? Whoever directed the James Bond movie after Casino Royale 
the the Daniel Craig Casino Royale, not the um, Woody Allen one. Uh, said you couldn't go to exotic locations anymore because people weren't impressed by them. Uh, I think he said because they'd been there, but. People don't get excited about um, locations anymore. And that used to be how movies were advertised. That's how uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Temple of Doom, probably even, maybe even Last Crusade. But definitely Temple of Doom advertised the locations they shot in. Not the most dynamic fight scene. Not bad. Connor's definitely trying to hide the makeup a little bit. That's the other thing is, is that he does things to try to hide the special effects deficiencies. That was a nice um, fade on... The camera movement there. I don't remember this at all. But again, we are delayed from finding out what happens to Tyler. Or Doug McClure. Bowen Tyler is the character. Now we have dinosaurs at night, which are probably going to look a little bit better than the daytime ones. Hmm, never mind. <laughs> Did Helen Hume shoot this... <laughs> the sacrifices... Tied down shots, especially um, the profile shot, this one. And then he turned around and shot this terrible dinosaur thing. I love that the professor knows dinosaur theory from the 1970s. Versus the 19, uh, I think late 19 teens. I think this one takes place in 1920 or 21. It looks like a dog. Looks like a hippo dog. But see how the dinosaurs are used not as they're they're more integrated into the story. than one might expect from uh, this type of genre movie. And it's very Connor's very gentle in how he packages the film um, as a sequel and everything else. This sequence, for example, is fantastic.
I assume this is day for night. Or... And so this movie came out, what, a year after the 76 uh, King Kong? One would assume the script was written. Yeah, because that was a December release. So. The idea of doing special effects while filming is another thing that's gone um, in many ways. In lens, is that how you, how you say it? Um, even when it's extremely problematic like in this film uh, seeing how those considerations affect the the rest of the filmmaking and what the um, the actors do I suppose they have to show more imagination when they're reacting to a uh, what is it a nerf ball on a stick but a Nerf ball on a stick, you can imagine a crappy looking uh, monster. You you have to you have to imagine it being real when everything is telling you that it isn't, as opposed to I don't know. I don't know anything about acting visualization exercises. Oh, there's another one of those monsters with the face that looks like the other one it's the eyes it's like they used all the same eyes yeah the scale on this is really weird it's just like and then the 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 way the armadillo dinosaur doesn't do anything reminds of that scene in um Star Wars where I think it's either the first or second shot of those things going around on the floor. I can't remember if Chewbacca growls at one first and then you see another one just going down, but just the the ways considered special effects work deliberate special effect deliberate practical effects work create an atmosphere to the film that you can't get when you add it in in CGI whether you're adding it in 20 years later or you know just in the movie, and it, it it's interesting that they seem to have understood that for Star Wars uh, eight or seven or whatever, and they they, they revealed that that ball droid was a practical on set in lens effect. I'm also a sucker for tropical island uh, scenery uh, location shooting. I, and not location shooting. Like I love seeing the old, uh, what is it, Indonesian uh, Hollywood movies like uh, the Mom adaptations of The Rains came. And does it feel like Planet of the Apes to anybody else? Um Yeah, Sarah Douglas was really good in the background in some of the other shots, but here she is just not doing anything. This is just weird. Like, it's just weird. 
And now he's just saying, welcome. Again. Tyler. Still haven't seen it. You'd almost believe this guy if his teeth weren't so bad. See, they're really actually nice. They just look mean. Look how polite they are. Wow, that was a weird little comedy interlude. I love these shots. Uh, the the long shot the in profile. Um, Close Encounters has that great one of the truck. But yeah, I mean, it's just like the sword and sorcery genre is completely dead. And that they were able to integrate it into a uh, dinosaur movie with this. And now we've got the Mountain of the Skulls, which is clearly a matte painting. But I guess if you'd asked me before I just saw that shot, I would have told you it was a giant set. There you go. It's the black narcissus of uh, Lost World movies. See, he's going nuts now. He should have had a friend, like a little dinosaur friend. That would have been fu funny. So now... Now things are getting goofy. That is David Prowse with the sword there. That is Darth Vader. Yeah, now we found our way into a uh, a Conan movie. <gasps> they tricked them. And on the, the MGM box cover, they've got this green dude, like, really big on it. And it feels like they haven't even seen the movie. It's pretty funny. I don't even know if this guy has any lines. Starting the the motif of having the... diminutive uh, lackey for these villains. In this case, it's a kid in a lot of makeup and the nails. Did anybody else just see that uh, Frank Frazetta looking painting on the wall? Looked like, uh, I think it's called Death Dealer. And 
Notice the ruler doesn't have to speak English, just the scary voice guy. And of course, they're going to be sacrificed. And so these are these, well, no, they're on horses already. So yeah, they, they could make that door. And now... So this is like scary. There are human bones everywhere. It's not It's not just a happy little adventure thing. What's got to be weird is that the time to have gone from land of the time forgot to at the earth's core to this. Because at the Earth's core and the other one, the Warlords of Atlantis, I think it's called, are very um, campy and incompetent. But this is like if um, Land the Time Forgot hadn't had the uh, quality bump of or quality pitfall of. Uh, at the Earth's core, there'd be an actual natural progression to it, but there's not. We still haven't seen um, Doug McClure, but we all know his voice, so we know that's him. Yeah, so I mean, this is like what the the Sinbad, Hercules, um, genre now. I don't know if we ever get to see bad guy's face. Okay, here we go. And look, it is classically Cheesecake Hanson, Doug McClure. And is it him? Is it him? Is it? Wait a second. He looks old and bearded. And it's. He narrated the first movie. I mean. It's like if, I don't know, Indiana Jones wasn't in an Indiana Jones movie till the 30 minute mark. I, th I really think Patrick Wayne was like close to 40 in this. He just looks really young Yeah, it's just like acting shots. Like, look at Connor holding these shots. I think he, he was a, he was appreciating Hume. He was appreciating having Hume. You can just see it.
See, doesn't that look like a set with that lighting on the top? Sorry. And I'm trying to remember. Do either of these guys? Oh, they're getting fed. So this is gross. What are those masks made out of that punching them doesn't hurt? Strangely silent, no music. Um, again, it's Connor being ambitious. Ooh. Yeah, there it is. There's that Frazetta painting. This is just some goofy Ed Wood. I want to know which one of these guys did their hair because I'm hoping it's David Prowse. And <laughs> did they not have enough money to pay John Scott to do more music or something? Like, again, we have this silent action sequence where Connor just took time for this aside between Patrick Wayne and Sarah Douglas and I, I, we saw the full set at some point, but he's he's shooting it like he doesn't have the actual set. It's cool. Um, the editing of it is just... That was them dropping some change for the sound effect. Okay. So now the three musketeers. And she took care of him herself. And all right. There's your sound effect. Uh, th yeah, the, the sound of the flames. It's uh, it's also the sound of going through V'ger in uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture. People are going to believe the story of the lost world now because 
he risked it. And now, this sequence doesn't really work. It's it's not dangerous enough. It's slow. The fight scene was so fluidly edited. This could have stuck around in the throne room and just been the breaking door and maybe what's his face getting the uh the bags, but we didn't need all that. Movie's only 91 minutes, though, so I suppose they couldn't cut much more. But the volcano just wasn't dangerous enough. Neither was the chase sequence. Like, if they'd done that and had, like, some tripping and things, that might have worked. I think we're going to get another mo cheap monster scare in a second. Yep. I wonder when the snake heads coming out of the uh, holes in the tunnel wall thing started since it's it was familiar by now is there some serial where it happens danger in the tunnel from the tunnel walls Again, if it was Hume shooting these, it's so weird because he's so good shooting the rest of it. But the special, the effects, the in-camera effects, he just doesn't know how to light it. Especially at this point in the movie when he's not trying to impress with the uh, special effects at all. The movie just stops and starts a lot. There you go. Sarah Douglas, smarter than Patrick Wayne. So now the island is blowing up. Cut. Oh, okay. This is basically how the other one ends, too. There's a, an environmental cataclysm and then the heroes have to run through it. In the first film, though, the budget wasn't there. In this one, there is, but in some ways, there's not, because in the first one, they destroyed a set. In this one, they're just setting off explosions mostly smoke grenades looks like in uh on location
because she's a military strategist. Um, it's kind of silly. We're getting that that bit of exposition just a little bit too silly. The the book, of course, has, I believe, the same sort of conclusion uh, with the island itself being alive, but eh, maybe not the same. Certainly not that it's tied to the volcano or things like that. Again, with no music. It makes a very... real. Sorry, I was just wondering if this would have worked better even if the the people are deformed with their masks off, it might have been better to have real expressions instead, even with bad makeup. Again, he just punched that helmet. That would hurt. Yep. And now they're retreating. See, in Planet of the Apes 2, you knew Charlton Heston just couldn't come back, right? Like, it wasn't gonna, he wasn't going to do a sequel. It was going to be something special. But in this one, Doug McClure is not Charlton Heston, you know, like... You don't expect him to come back um, for a little bit. It's not like he was busy winning an Academy Award or something. So... And he was the whole reason to watch the movie. He's he, Right? To find out what happened to him. And it just... It just sort of kills your investment, right? But then it reveals that it, it hasn't killed your investment. Back in a cave, so there's going to be a monster. Uh, either at the Earth, I think it was at the Earth's core, had a lot of running through cave shots, too. The less, the better. I'm trying. I There can't be too complicated of an effect sequence. Just because of uh, budgetary constraints, but...
no music again. It's so weird. There we go. There's the uh, monster from before. Caves from before. I'm not sure what... You know, look at the way this thing's moving. It's not that big of a danger. It's sort of a dumb... Sloth thing. Like... They're just being mean to it. In some ways. Look at how slow it moves. But this, of course, was before you worried about making uh, animals sympathetic in these types of movies. Uh, now all of them have at least one sympathetic um, creature, either because of... Look, see, all it wanted was the bag. It doesn't want to eat a person. It wants to eat a... Um, it wants to eat film. Like, it should be cute. And now, this is just mean. It's just... I don't know. But again, it's a long, long sequence. pointlessly mean-spirited, but it's also the longest there's been a uh, dinosaur in the story uh, or a monster in the story. Just mean... But then again, the island is destroying itself and seeing any of the um, wildlife. I mean, it's, they're killing all the um, people, too. We just don't see that with the sympathetic ones. Um, but I was saying... That's the longest one of the creatures has been sort of in the movie. So they could have just left it to the, uh, the little sloth monster and then he would have been happy. And instead, they had to fight for the notes that they lost anyway. Yeah, I don't think there's been any music since... The, uh, oh, look, they are going to show the destruction of the the natives. I don't think there's been any music since uh, they, just before they got to the Mountain of the Skulls. It's almost like, yeah, they, they, they ran out of money after an hour for John Scott. Notice I'm not talking about the story at all, because, you know, talking about the story is like talking about the cave girl. It's, it's very obvious. Mm-hmm. 
you know, Connor can't figure out how to do that shot. <laughs> These are good, though. And they've already established that they can kill off um, the whole reason for watching the movie. So there is an element of danger. Not a lot, though. But there is definitely this sense they might not make it back to the ship in time. Whether they survive whether or not they get to the excuse me whether or not they get to the plane that's pretty much a given but they could be stranded there got to find out where this filmed i can't remember um was it in Spain, maybe? I, I don't know, remember how I found that out. Because the last time I looked, I could not... I could not figure out where it filmed. No... Um, music, no... Banter um, in ADR. And now the music returns. Big time. The music returns big time. See... The present action of the movie is really like what? It feels like four days, right? Maybe like three. When did they sleep? They slept when they got to the Mountain of the Skulls. They slept the night before that. So, yeah, it feels like three days. It, it, I think it's supposed to be longer. Um Like they were held captive for longer. I don't know. As with all um, all these uh, movies with these types of planes, I always wonder where people sit. Wow. A lot of explosions. I can't remember. Is the rest of her tribe dead because she's now leaving them to die? Now, back to a model that I want. Was that a composite shot? Oh, they're dragging it through. That is practical effects, and that is really well lit from Hume. He just doesn't know how to shoot um, reptilian life forms. That's all it is. Now we got a shot that there's, there was your model shot. And the editing's a little bit off on those. Except for that one, the uh, head on shot of it. Yeah, this sequence doesn't have enough establishing shots of the ground. It's. 
strangely off. Um, just because they seem to get it um, in the earlier sequence. And by now, there's no reason not to forgive the... Uh, Um, you've got the snow on the plane, so that adds a, a level of reality to it. So now the camera's gone, too. Um, there's no evidence of, of what occurred. Uh, I don't know, the movie doesn't handle that particularly well. So it's a three-seater because of the, the gun seat up front. But did they just say crikey? I think he just said crikey. Now that's a great effect shot. See, I feel like if they'd done more with the takeoff with ground shots, uh, they could have evened out the special effects more. The miniature effects. But there's no um, ex exploration wonderment to this sequence which the first sequence did so well. Um, then, of course, you get the, that shot, and that was fine. Because the boat's always been a miniature, so you can't dismiss it. Oh, look, there's the bu uh, the plane. Nice music. Nice exit comedy. Yep, okay, so here we go. Santa Cruz, De La Palma, and Pinewood Studios. Um, no, really look at the weight of uh, this expedition where Tyler died. No story of what happens to... Um, The island, um, 
but it also doesn't matter to some degree. Because you've got your John Scott score and your vaguely what would you call that font? It's um, Conan-like, but pre-Conan. And... Yeah, they just went out on a big effect shot. A big miniature effect shot. Um, yeah, so... People of the time forgot. I like that movie. And Leo roars us out. So I actually have absolutely no idea what's on next episode. So let me go look at that real quick. Um, I really should have that sort of thing written down somewhere. Oh, I do, but I mean, I should have it ready to go. Uh, next episode is going to be, oh, Innocent Blood. So, uh, July 20th will be the Innocent Blood, uh, commentary. That's a John Landis movie. Uh, thank you for listening to the People That Time Forgot episode. Not sure how many people are going to be listening to that since... Uh, it's the people that time forgot, but um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did listen to it, and uh, thanks for listening. Very redundant. Thanks for listening. <laughs>